It's the really useful podcast, the tech podcast for technophobes from makeuseof.com. This week, we're looking at Microsoft Excel's new team up. We're looking at how Microsoft is taunting Apple. We'll be taking a look at 15 must-have Windows apps and software for any new PC, and much more besides. My name is Christian Colley, and with me is Ben Stegner. How are you, Ben? Hello, Christian. I am doing pretty well. Uh, I don't have anything woody to say this week. I feel like I should have something a little bit funnier to say, but I, I don't have anything to say. That, that, okay. It's just a little wisecrack, so hopefully I'll, uh, I'm banking my humor for later on. Okay. Wisecracking wise guy. Okay. That's me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have a, a usual packed show to get through. We have the latest tech news that matters. None of that nonsense about buyouts and uh, who said what and which CEO is joining which company. This is tech news about technology that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got tips and tricks to help you make better use of all sorts of devices, computers, mobile devices, uh, TVs, small computers, everything. And we've also got some recommendations. Those are things that uh, Ben and myself have experienced over the past few days and decided we like. And we want to share that information with you so you can make your own judgment and maybe follow it up and perhaps, you know, try it out yourself. We're going to kick off with the news that Microsoft Excel is teaming up with EVE Online. Um, which, if you don't know, EVE Online is a massive online game which has been going for, I'm, I'm going to say 20 years. It can't be far off that, Ben. Let me check. I, I know the name, but I have never played it. I'm not familiar with it. Let's see. It launched in 2003. So, yeah, yeah, almost 20 not years. Not far off, yeah. I remember when I worked in an IT department in the NHS many years ago, a few of the uh, guys there were players in uh, EVE Online. Uh, Engadget has originally reported that space explorers from around our globe can enjoy the power of Excel in EVE Online. Uh, it features a number crunching in-world environment, which you do take a lot of time sort of working things out. Because it's, it's, if you remember Elite, there's a, an aspect of Elite to EVE Online. Uh, so it's, there's trading, there's exploration and there's combat, but it's kind of as as maximum as you can imagine that being with thousands of players, if not millions of players around the world, all doing the same, that sort of thing. Uh, so they've decided to bring in uh, spreadsheet support. I've, it's kind of an odd, like not super exciting thing for a game, <laughs> you know, like it's, hey, we got spreadsheets, woo! But yeah, I know. <laughs> with, this, with this kind of game, I suppose it is something that could be exciting like i'm tr I'm thinking about like games where having some kind of connection with maybe like um you know maybe like a game where you want to like take your own notes or like draw your own map it could yep. be useful to have like a trusted service integrate with that so i'm kind of thinking about it from that perspective but well no you're right. i think you're right sheet. i think you're right and i think there is another game franchise where this could be useful football manager Oh yeah, to keep track of your player stats and yeah, run some the whole, like, samples, the and... whole shebang. Yeah, I mean, many many years ago, I can't, I don't have the time or the stomach for it these days. But many years ago, there was a game called Championship Manager, which late, which you know, the team behind that uh, switched uh, publishers and it became Football Manager, and it's basically a spreadsheet game with you know stats for players like their ability stats their performance stats their training stats all that stuff stats 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 what do you want what do you do with stats you view them in excel now football manager has got quite a good reporting screen but i th i mean it seems like a good opportunity for some more integration microsoft team keen to uh <laughs> bring <laughs> Microsoft Excel support into games. <laughs> Who Spread the gospel coming? of Microsoft Excel through. <laughs> I mean, I guess you think their idea could be if you're somehow not familiar with Excel or you're on the fence about it, and then you play a game like Football Manager and you really like the Excel support in there, you might be tempted to buy it for your own purposes. I don't, at this point, I feel like it, Microsoft Office kind of sells itself. I, mean, I don't really feel like there's many yeah. people that have no idea what it is or what it can do. So it's kind of an odd, maybe it it's is. just like people, you know, you always ask the same thing, like why does McDonald's advertise when everybody knows what it is? So maybe it's just that same kind of thing, just keeping mm. it in your head and spreading maybe. it out in more areas. Maybe. I mean, I don't know why Microsoft, or why McDonald's advertises because it has absolutely zero effect on me, but 
that's another matter entirely. Uh, this isn't Microsoft Excel's first dabble with games, though. And many, many years ago, there was a hidden game in Excel. I think it was the Works Edition or the 95 Edition around that time. And you would go to, like, cell A99 or A100 or something like that, type in a particular formula, and it would take you to a sort of a Doom-style 3D world. I think yeah. I, I I don't think I ever played it, but I remember hearing about that. It yeah. was like a that like flat 3D. Yeah, it's like an yeah. Easter egg. Yeah, yeah, and you'd go in and then you'd see the names of tortured souls. Uh, they worked at Microsoft, right? Yep, yeah, that's right. Yeah. The people who developed it. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of amusing. You can uh, check it out on YouTube. I'll try and include it in the show notes, which uh, you'll find everything that we discuss in this week's show in the show notes. Uh, we will move on to Microsoft's other slightly gaming related thing. Uh, they um, you may know that um, you can't play Fortnite on an iPhone or an iPad because of a uh, dispute between Epic Games and Apple. Microsoft are helping Fortnite get around this by including, sorry, helping Epic Games get around this by including Fortnite on the Xbox Game Pass cloud gaming service, which you can play on an iPhone. It's a bit cheeky, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit of a... Uh... Odd, as the article says, it's kind of weird for a free-to-play game to be added into a paid service. But with this, it actually makes sense in this specific instance. It. I mean, I, I don't know. Are they asking for trouble with this, though? Epic and Microsoft? I guess if it depends on whose idea it was. I mean, I, I don't know. It depends. I guess Epic... It, if there's like further follow up on this and Apple is trying to prove that Epic acted in bad faith, then they could use this as evidence, like in a court setting, I would assume. But also, I don't know. It's not like Epic is like breaking the law. They're just trying to get around Apple's terms. Yeah. They've been also had trouble like, getting it Game Pass on to iOS. Um, yeah, it was on Android first, yeah. which doesn't surprise, shouldn't surprise no, you. Of course not. Apparently, there was an agreement that it was only going to work out if every single game was independently reviewed by Apple. I didn't know that. I wasn't aware that it went yeah. that far. So it could be that Apple changed their mind and removes Game Pass again. Yeah, I don't know if that... I wish I had... I, I wasn't aware of that. I would have looked into this more. I don't know if that means that Microsoft has to check with Apple to make sure that every game on Game Pass is approved, period, or if the iOS version of Game Pass only lets you play games that Apple has said okay to. You know, like, I'm not sure if it's... I, mean, I would imagine the first one's probably too pervasive. I mean, they wouldn't want to check with Apple every time there's a brand new game. But On the other hand, someone at Apple's got a really good job checking all the games. Yeah. I mean, this is fun. I better play through the whole thing to make sure that it... Yeah, uh, yeah. To make sure it's appropriate. Yeah. Because you would yeah. think, like, the the rating system, like, there's no games that are rated, like... 18 plus or anything like they don't sell those in stores here i'm sure it's the same way in in the uk and other areas so it's like they're gonna the only reason they want to block it is for something like this so maybe that's why they preserve the right to want to do that that could be that could be a case yeah uh, we'll see how that turns out um i've got to say my experience of Fortnite is pretty m minimal beyond adverts and youtube videos i haven't played it. it's not i don't really think it's my cup of tea I played Fortnite when it was when the, when the battle royale was fairly new. Uh, I had some friends that I was playing with fairly regularly, just different games at the time, and we tried it. I I have that was like my first battle royale, and I really don't enjoy them much. And I also don't like the building mechanic. I just never felt up to speed on it. Um, I'm not a big battle royale fan either. Apex Legends is all right. I enjoy that, and I've been playing a game with my friends called Hunt Showdown. That's not I wouldn't really call it a battle royale, but it has some of the same type of elements. But I agree, Fortnite never grabbed me the way it seems to have been so popular with a lot of people. Hmm. Tips and tricks now, and we're going to kick off with uh, Windows again. Oh, what's going on? It's a Microsoft-centric show at the moment. Uh, if you get a new PC or you've newly upgraded your PC from Windows 10 to Windows 11, you're probably thinking about what software you should install. Uh, there's a few, you know, obvious options like choosing the preferred browser and maybe cloud storage, particularly if you're wanting to sync files back onto your computer that you use on a regular basis. There are so many applications that you could install, but which ones should you install? Uh, now, a chap called Ben Stegner has compiled... Oh, it's you. 
has compiled a list of, yeah, a list of 15 must-have Windows apps and software for any new PC. Yeah, so this list is for if you are if you get a brand new computer or maybe you upgrade your computer from Windows 10 to 11 and you think it's time to start fresh and you want to just, just get the essential apps, uh, this list is for you. So we can go through them quickly here. And there's no particular order here. And also some of them are up to preference. So not every single app is the 100% best choice for everybody. But in most cases, these are the ones I'd recommend. Okay. Um, so first is the browser. I did pick Chrome for this just because it's so... It's just the standard right now um, with the with this huge list of extensions. I still do think it's generally the best for most people, but um, Firefox and even Edge itself are still really good options that are free of Google's tendrils. So that might be a, a better option for you. Um, number two for cloud storage, I picked Google Drive. And the reason I picked that is because you get 15 gigabytes of space for free. So it's the one with the most free space. Even if you prefer another company, um, they don't give as much for free. Um, for music streaming, I like Spotify on Windows. Um, I think I, I I think it works really well. It's, it, the app can be kind of janky. Like they'll introduce new updates and there's bugs occasionally. But uh, Spotify is a desktop app, so unlike uh, some other services where you can only use it in your browser, uh, it is a desktop app. Uh, Office Suite, LibreOffice. We were talking earlier about how Microsoft Office kind of sells itself. Um, if you don't actually need Office, and you can check out LibreOffice. It's a free open source version uh, of a, a similar software that has everything you need for basic spreadsheets and files and, or uh, PowerPoint presentations and things like that. Uh, for editing images, I like Paint.net. It's a pretty straightforward image editor that lets you do a lot more than Microsoft Paint does, but it's not super overwhelming to where like Photoshop can be. Uh, we like Malwarebytes Anti-Malware for security. So Windows Defender that comes with Windows 10 and 11 is good enough for most people, but Malwarebytes is a good second opinion. Uh, even if you don't pay for the premium version, you can still do an on-demand scan for a second opinion. VLC is probably the best media player. It's free. It opens everything you throw at it. So if you ever find a weird file that your computer can't play by default, VLC will make it happen for both audio and video. ShareX is a great screenshot editor. Uh, it's really good for both taking and editing screenshots, and you can do all sorts of stuff with it where you have automatic workflows. So if you take a lot of screenshots, definitely give ShareX a look. Uh, for file compression, we like 7-Zip. It's a little bit ugly, but it does everything you need it to do. Uh, if you need to extract any file that's not a regular zip file that Windows can't deal with, 7-Zip makes it really easy. Uh, a couple other ones. Uh, Clip Clip is a really good clipboard manager. So if you're not familiar, a clipboard manager makes it so it remembers more than one thing that you've copied and pasted recently. And you can also pin things that you paste frequently to it. So you can easily paste them without having to go back and recopy them. Uh, we like Bitwarden for a password manager. We've talked a lot about how password managers are great. Bitwarden is the best free one and it has a native app for Windows. And Tree Size Free is a really useful storage management tool. It scans your drive and tells you what, uh, how much space is being taken up by what files. So when you run low on space, it's a really easy way to check uh, which files and folders are using the most space. So you don't have to go hunting for them yourself. And that's that's the highlights. So uh, that's a lot to download at once. But I, we talked before about Ninite, which is super useful. N I N I T E. Um, it doesn't have every single one of these apps, but it has most of them. And you can go to that site and check all the apps you want and click download, and you get them all in one bundle instead of having to go to every individual site and grab them and run through the the setup boxes. That's a very cool feature. I think um, a lot of these they don't have exact uh, uh, comparative. Uh, apps on mac os and on linux but they all have very close uh companions i suppose you'd call them uh so uh yeah you it's um while the names may differ slightly they're all very good similar sort of apps that uh you could uh, pick up uh, a few of them across on the other platforms as well uh thank you very much ben for that sure. now then um if you were using youtube and uh you I didn't know this um, until, um, you know, YouTube had been around a while and I was using it in a particular way. And I discovered that my wife and my mother-in-law were basically using YouTube as a jukebox. And they were playing um, playlists and stuff and doing all that kind of thing. So they were, I was using YouTube for you know, tutorial videos and movie trailers and stuff. And they were, you know, they had the 
own playlist and all that kind of thing. And so I'm like, this is five or six years ago and I discovered this. And, uh, you know, obviously YouTube is a very popular way to listen to music. But what if you struggle to identify the song that you're listening to? This happens to me all the time, mainly because I come across music on YouTube that I'm not looking for. It's when my kids are watching it or whatever, and uh, it's not really music that I'm familiar with. I have a particular niche musical interest that uh, is, it has a lot of uh, depth and interest to it that is um, enough to remember. Never mind trying to remember the uh, names of modern acts. How do you find out what you're listening to on YouTube? Ben Stegner, can you help me out here? I can help you out and I definitely understand your problem because I've had the same thing happen where sometimes people, sometimes a video uploader will include like all the songs they use or they'll even put it on the screen, which is really nice because um, there's gaming YouTubers I watch that'll just play music from various games in the background. Yeah. You'll hear it and be like, oh yeah, I want to check that out. And then you have no idea how to figure it out. So uh, next time that happens to you, there's a, a couple easy ways you can use to find out uh, what music was in a video. Um, so the first and easiest way is to actually check the description of the video on YouTube. So um, YouTube's copyright system actually will, if it detects copyrighted music, you'll see a music in this video field in the description. Right. And that'll obviously make it clear which one, which song it is. Um, that won't happen for everything. So if it's like a remix or a music from a video game or something, it probably won't appear there. But you should still check the description because a lot of video uploaders, like I said, they'll include... The name of the song in their own line even if it's not auto detected by youtube um a second good way to do it is just to do a quick google search for the lyrics this sounds obvious but um if the song has lyrics in the video and you can make them out just grab a line or two and then paste that into google and that should very easily bring up a youtube video of the song or a similar site where you can find um what lyrics the song was for Sometimes it might be a cover, you know, so a lot of the time, like movie trailers will use a cover of a song. So you may have to search a little bit, but if you listen to a couple of videos of that song, you should find the cover version that you heard. Um, and there's also actually Shazam for Chrome. I, when I updated this article, I didn't realize that Shazam has an official Chrome extension now. Oh. Um, so you can install, I think it's, it's in Chrome and it might be in other browsers, but it's at least in Chrome. Um, it works just like Shazam on your phone where you install the extension, yeah. you click on the button and then whatever you're playing in a tab, it just tells you what it hears. Um, and if that doesn't work, there's another extension called AHA Music. And you can also just do the, the lower tech way of just pulling Shazam up on your phone and playing it into your computer speakers or whatever that'll help nice. find it. Yeah. So that, that, those are kind of the obvious ones. And then if that, those don't work, there's two um, ones that are a little bit deeper. So you can search the comments for the song name. So um, if other people enjoyed that song too, they might've asked. So um, you can look at yourself. There's also a website called YT comment finder where you can search all of the comments for something and see, oh, right. you know, what's the song and That's see cool. if someone answered it. And if no one did, you can ask yourself, um, just be ready for people to say Darude, Sandstorm, and other joke answers, because people always say that. Um, and if nothing else works, there are forums like uh, Name That Song on Reddit, or there's a website called What That Song uh, that'll help you, other people will help you find it. So if you post a video and say, you know, it's the song at three minutes in, and I looked on all of these sites and can't find it, um, other people might be able to help you find it there. So... Um, hopefully one of the earlier ones makes it easy to find, but if it's a really tough one, these ways will help you dig in a little deeper. Privacy and online privacy, online security, digital security, all those things are th th something that's intrigued me deeply for many years and uh, probably kicked off by an, uh, an occasion, which I may have mentioned on the show before, uh, when we, my wife and I were we weren't even married at the time, were uh, scammed out of a ring on eBay. That has uh, snowballed that interest. And uh, I discovered that some properties, not just faces, but properties on Google are blurred out. I was intrigued to find out why blurring happened and how it can be done. So this is on Google Street View rather than Google Maps. And what happens is that you will be browsing through Street View and you come across a property that is blurred out and you can't see any detail about the property. Often there'll be a car in the drive, so you won't see any detail about that or the garden detail. And sometimes it spills over onto the neighbors. Now it turns out that uh, Google offers the facility to blur out a property, but it's not necessarily a good idea to do. So I'll just give you a quick overview on how to blur your house in Google Maps, okay? 
so you open Google Maps Street View at maps.google.com and you navigate to your home and you drag the Street View icon to the road beside your house and then you rotate the mouse as necessary to focus the view on your property. In the bottom right corner, you'll click on Report a Problem. You'll check the address is correct. Then you adjust the image preview to focus on your home. And then below this, under Why are you reporting this image? You select Request Blurring. And then to blur the house, you select My Home. And then you're required to provide information to support the blurring. Uh, they want up to 1,500 characters, so you would cite privacy reasons. And then you provide your email address to confirm it and do the capture validation, then submit. And not long after, it should be blurred. Now, there is a problem with this. It can't be undone. Now, if you lived in rented accommodation and you moved, first and foremost, your landlord's got a problem if they wanted to advertise the property using uh, Street View, like a lot of... Uh, uh, estate agents and uh, real estate agents do. And if you're selling the property, it's the same again. It can't be undone. So you're leaving someone with the problem of having a blurred out property, which isn't really particularly friendly, is it? Now, that's not entirely the fault of the person doing the blurring, because if Google can blur the property, they can probably unblur it, especially since they do do quite a lot of street view circuits, don't they? Yeah, I was going to say, you would think, I understand why it's permanent in the sense that maybe they figure if someone asked for it there was a reason so they don't want to just let someone else undo it but you do have to think you know if someone asked for it in a rental and then seven years later somebody else is there there shouldn't really be a problem with unblurring it but who knows they may have a different reason yeah now i mean we know, we all know that street view car goes around quite often uh in most cases. In my own case, and uh, one of the photos in the article is actually of my home, the damn car has been around once in seven years. So we were looking at a 2015 representation of our home until um, either earlier this year or late last year. It was very, very frustrating as if we lived in the past compared with the rest of the town. It actually is funny. I've done that once or twice when I like I'm going somewhere I've never been before and I want to look it up to make sure I like understand where to park or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then the, the, you don't realize the picture is like years out of date. Um, and it is kind of funny to see like how it looked. My, my parents' house, they planted um, evergreen trees years ago. And one of the times I remember looking like the, the, the picture had been taken early on in those trees lives. So they were like no, almost nothing. And then you go over there now and you know, it's been years. So they're pretty tall and it's funny to, see it like that like the way you used to remember it we were in london a few weeks ago and the car itself went past us whilst we were stood outside hamleys now i'm interested now to know if we were photographed or not because when i checked it a few days about a week after we were there i had a look on uh, street view outside the Hamleys toy shop, and it was dated February. Ah, it's still dated February. We were there in April. Okay. So I think that's that's quite a lot of activity. And uh, you could say, well, it's London, so it's kind of fair enough. And, yeah, fair enough, it's London. Um, but I'm, I'm interested to know what their sort of turnaround is. Like from getting the footage to yeah, actually to updating the map, yeah. Uploading it, yeah. I'm going to say, if it was... Um, I mean, this is dated February and we were there in April, so it's presumably two months when it comes to London and pre presumably other cities as well. So maybe next month I will be photographed outside Hamleys on Regent but Street. But they, they auto London. blur faces anyway, they do, right? So I, you would, yeah. we, well, I was with my family, so we would know it was us. Yeah, that's right. It would be pretty obvious. It wouldn't just be, yeah. just be you that you'd have to figure out, like, remember what you were wearing or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll see how that goes anyway. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, what you need to know about uh, blurring your house on Google Street View. Why you should do it, why you might not want to do it. And that brings us to the part of the show where we give you our recommendations of things that we think you might be interested in checking out. Now, I went to the cinema a couple of days ago, and I thought I might have a really good recommendation. 
But, uh, yeah, yeah. spoilers aside, uh, there isn't really an awful lot to recommend about Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Um, there's a couple of good bits, but uh, it's no Thor Ragnarok. I have I have not seen pretty much any Marvel movie of the past like five or so years at least, so I'm I'm definitely far behind on which ones are considered to be the best or the worst. Yeah, well, Thor, Thor Rag, you must have seen Thor Ragnarok then, if you. Uh, I'm honestly that might be longer than 2015, I think. The, I think the last one I saw was Captain America: Civil War. I mean, it's been oh, okay, that was a long time ago. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. okay. Um, <laughs> Thor, Thor Ragnarok is probably my favorite Marvel movie for many reasons. But uh, as I say, I'm not going to recommend uh, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. You will all have to uh, go and see it yourselves and make your own mind up. Maybe you'll understand why I can't recommend it. However, there's something I can recommend. You'll be delighted to know. In front of me. Instead of all this goddamn waffling, because I've recently reviewed a uh, MIDI keyboard. It is called the Popu Piano. Now, I've mentioned the Popu Lely, which is a ukulele, and the Popu Guitar, which is unsurprisingly a guitar, on previous really useful podcasts. The Popu Piano is the keyboard version of these things. It is a MIDI keyboard with a mobile device, uh, mobile app that runs on iOS and Android, and you basically use it to learn piano. It comes with, uh, I think it's 29 keys. It has an additional 18 buttons arranged in uh, six rows as uh, six additional keys for chords, uh, which connects to the main device, but the main device will work without it. And it syncs over Bluetooth to a mobile device. You get the app, and then you start learning keyboard. I uh, played with this for a good uh, four to six weeks recently. I produced a video review for MakeUseOff as well as a written review. And I was absolutely blown away by how good it was and how I was able to get to grips with some basic keyboard things that I hadn't managed to get to grips with at any point in the previous sort of 35 years of uh, playing musical instruments. It was quite, quite an amazing experience. I wouldn't so this say was I, your first experience with playing keyboard or piano at all? Was yeah, that right? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, um, I mean, I have friends who had keyboards and stuff like that, but I'd never really, I just, I'd never got the whole moving your fingers around in that way compared with doing it on a guitar. So it's just uh, something I just, you know, it was there and I just let other people handle it when I was in bands and things. So uh, it's, I was really surprised by how effortless it it got me playing music and it uses the guitar hero sort of flying colored blocks coming towards you for you to uh, press the correct corresponding colored button the keys have uh, colored leds underneath them so you can get your timing right as they uh, as it meets the uh, digital representation of your keyboard on screen and you know i was i was playing cold play you know i wasn't playing every every single part of the chord and melody but these the, the key bits that it trains you into doing is it build your skills with songs you know i was playing a coldplay song. sure i never in a million years thought i'd be playing a coldplay song in a, on any instrument never mind on a keyboard yeah that's a good like milestone after only playing for a relatively short yeah. amount of time it's not like you're playing you know mary had a little exactly. lamb that, that, i mean there was a bit of london bridges falling down in there early early on but uh, the other thing about this because it's a midi keyboard it will connect to uh garage band and logic and cakewalk and all those types of apps with very little effort, and then you can just start building, creating music in those apps. It's a superb piece of kit. Now, it's currently uh, crowdfunding on Indiegogo. At the time of recording this podcast, it has three days left and is at, uh, no, this is in pounds, 248,000 British pounds, which that's going to be going towards the 270 dollars two hundred seventy thousand dollars area i think uh let me see yeah uh, it's three hundred five thousand eight hundred i was going to say three hundred dollars and i thought funded. no that's probably um over overestimating slightly so it is definitely worth getting hold of it's probably i mean if you have the opportunity to get into indiegogo before before um when this podcast goes live and grab it then by all means do so you probably won't be able to but you should keep an eye out for it uh once it goes uh big star because it's a really really good device i'm so impressed with it and you know as somebody plays guitar and ukulele and i've played the 
pop your guitar and the pop ukulele, and they are very good. But this has totally blown me away. So that's my recommendation for this week. Nice. What have you got, Ben? Uh, I have actually got another game uh, that I played a f- about a m- three weeks ago, um, but I thought it'd be a good general recommendation. Um, so there's another puzzle game. This game is called Return of the Obra Din. It's O B R A D I N N. And it is a logic puzzle game where you play as an insurance mm-hmm. agent for a ship company in 1807. Okay. And there was a ship called the Obra Din that disappeared at sea five years prior. And everybody just assumed that it was just lost at sea. And then it mysteriously reappears and there's nobody alive on the ship. And you're given a, a, a compass, which has the ability to let you, when you find a body on the ship, you can watch the few moments that lead up to that person's death. Like in, you can listen to it and then it, you see the moment when they died. So your job as the insurance agent is to go around. You have a couple pictures that show everybody who was on the ship. You have a map of the ship and you have like a crew manifest log. And you're it, using that, you have to figure out who everyone was and how they died or if they're still alive. Um, so it's, it's like I said, it's a logic puzzle. So sometimes you'll have obvious ones, you know, like if you saw, if you watch someone die from getting shot and someone says, no, Jim, and there's only one Jim on the ship, then obviously, you know, mm-hmm. that was him. But sometimes you have to use other clues like someone's accent or where they were sleeping. So, you know, what kind of crew member they were or the clothes they were wearing or that kind of thing to kind of put the pieces right. together. So it's a really good, like straight logic puzzle game. Like if you don't like like silly clues and puzzle games where like your character's talking out loud and like gives you the answer away, it's really good for that. And it uses a system too, where you have to get three they call them fates for each like the person and how they died you have to get three of those correct at a time for them to be like checked off and confirmed so you can't just randomly guess and get one by one you have to get three at a time so yeah it's a good story the way that you like you go through like the timeline of what happened on the ship you learn more about what happened and yeah if you like thinking through things and kind of keeping a big picture in your mind and keeping notes about who's who, then you, you definitely like it. It's a enjoyable experience. I'm looking at the website now and uh, I'm seeing the images. Is this a game with static images or are these just like screenshots from moving around within this world? They are screenshots. Now, yeah, you walk around on the ship, but when you use your compass, like you, you hear what happened, like the screen goes black and white and you see subtitles of people talking if they were and you hear what happened, and then, like, the moment that the person died, you see a freeze frame, but you can walk around it. So when you use the compass, that moment is frozen in time, but you can interact with things and and try to figure out what happened. And the game does a decent job of, like, it doesn't totally throw you to your own devices. Like, when you look at the, the picture of all the crew... Some, a person's face will be blurry if you don't have enough info to figure out who they mm-hmm. are yet. And then there's little marks, like there'll be one, two, or three like triangles on the person to show like how how hard of a deduction it is to know who they are. Yeah. So like one mark would be, like I said, like someone obviously like yells out their name yeah. or something. And then two or three would be more like you have to connect the dots with where that person was earlier in the story or whatever. So Okay, that looks really cool. Yeah, it could it could be a fun game. It's the kind of game where once you play it once, you can't really play it again because you yeah, know what happened. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, it would be the kind of fun game, like I mentioned with Baba's You a month or two ago. It would be a fun game to like play side by side with a friend or a loved one or whatever because you can kind of walk through it together and think out loud together and kind of cooperate on it. But it's it was fun by myself cool. too. So yeah, excellent. So that's uh, that's Ben's suggestion: the return of the Obra Din. <laughs> That brings us to the end of this week's really useful podcast with myself, Christian Corley, and himself, Ben Stegner. Everything that we've discussed in this show, you will find in the show notes which accompany this podcast, uh, both on Make Use Of and on Spotify and on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts. Um, If you use a different provider, the information may not be there, so do check it out at makeuseof.com to find those links. If you can uh, share the podcast as well on uh, your favourite social media, if you find something useful in this that you think a friend or relative may benefit from, or just Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, follow us, then by all means do share that. And if you think there's anything that we should know or you'd like to tell us, then uh, you can get in touch with us either through Facebook 
or through Twitter using the uh, accounts listed in the show notes. Ben and myself will be back for another release or podcast soon. Until then, take care and goodbye. <laughs>